good morning thanks for the kind introduction sir so uh, going straight to the topic uh, bppv is the most common cause of vertigo so though not fully understood bppv is thought to arise due to the displacement of autoconia from the macule of the inner ear into the fluid foot semicircular canals so uh, it is practical to think that once you uh, reposition the those things to where it belongs so the symptoms should settle so there has been uh, studies which shows that uh, compared to placebo uh, it is effective almost 81% uh, and placebo is almost 37% uh, so introducing so introducing the speakers the pro speaker is mr ak words was a senior consultant neurologist in ch mrc udaipur he did his mbbs and md from rnt medical college udaipur rajasthan and he did his dmt dm neurology in 2005 in pgmr chandigarh he has almost 20 uh, publications in national and international indexed peer reviewed journals first to identify and report apogeotrophic variant of the posterior semicircular canal bppv from india in 2020 largest series of horizontal canal so uh, canal uh, bppv published from india and he has authored three chapters the uh, con speaker is uh, mr uh, dr tk banerji is a medical director and chief consultant neurologist national neurosciences center kolkata dr banerji has participated as plenary speaker and co-chair in numerous international conferences he has 63 major publications and 29 publications abstracts in leading peer reviewed international journals he is a member of editorial board and reviewer of several international journals the moderator is dr ramat ramat araknath is currently the chief neurologist amaravati institute of medical sciences bandur he is emeritus professor of neurology ntr university of health sciences and former professor of neurology department of neurology gundur medical college and general hospital between 1993 and 2004 he has delivered lectures in several national and international conferences including two lectures in uh, uh, mg uh, mg hospital and harvard, harvard uh, school boston usa He is the recipient of uh, Sri uh, Tumala Rama Brahma Me Memorial Research Award for the best scientific paper for the year 2001 and non-pupil cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and best teacher award NRA Medical College in 2016. The chairperson is Dr. Rajiv Anand. He is presently working as Senior Director, Department of Neurology at BLK Max Super Specialty Hospital, New Delhi. Always looking, he always looks out for accuracy in clinical diagnosis and treatments. Focuses on treatable neurological disorders and cost-effective therapies in neurology. Dr. Rajiv Anand has a passion for making a difference in the care of a of a patient with neurological disorders. So uh, let's move on to the uh, topic. Uh, the uh, I think the poll has. Yes, uh, studio. If I can request you to please start the poll. So the opinion poll is BPPV volume manner enough. The audience has to select yes, no, or not sure. So we'll give them thirty seconds. Just hold on. Dr. Prabhash, you can now declare the result. Uh, I hope yes. you can see it on the screen yes. and uh, then so, hand it to the pro speaker. So the question was BPPV, only manuals are enough. The answer, uh, the 66.67 people are opining that it's no and S is 22.22 and not sure is 11.11%. So it's uh, more in favor that it's not the only, that it's not that only manuals are enough. So let's move on to the uh, talk. I'll, I'll invite the uh, pro speaker, Dr. A.K. Woods, to start the proceedings. Yes.
Sure, Dr. Watts, now you can upload your slide. Yeah, I think it's coming up. Uh, should I start? Yes, sir, please go ahead. BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Only manuals, public physical therapy are enough. My views are favorably disposed towards manuals alone. These are my declarations. So, the vestibular system and organs are semicircular canals that sense angular head acceleration and otolith organs that sense the linear head acceleration. True external vertigo indicates an abnormality of semicircular canals or their central yeah. connections that process signals from the semicircular canals. Floating or tilting sensation may indicate an otolith system disorder. So, Vestibular labyrinths, which are paired structures in human beings, the CNS receives signals from both right and left membranous labyrinths and collates these signals. The stationary head, the tonic discharges from both vestibular efferents are exactly balanced. During motion, the right and left membranous labyrinth are alternately excited and inhibited, leading to a left-right difference in the vestibular nerve activity, which is recognized as motion. So, See, there are a pair of semicircular canal uh, uh, which work as a yog pair. For example, when there is an angular head acceleration and right posterior semicircular canal in depolarizes and increases its rate of firing, the left anterior semicircular canal hyperpolarizes and decreases its rate of firing to the same extent. And this is also holds vice versa. And this also holds for the two horizontal semicircular canals so that when the right horizontal canal depolarizes and increases its firing rate, the left horizontal semicircular canal hyperpolarizes and decreases its rate of firing to the same extent. So, this is a steady state maintained of no vertigo during the angular head acceleration due to symmetrical firing of the paired yog canals, which is shown by animation in this diagram. So, the anterior canal on one side is with the, the posterior canal on the upper side. So, what happens during the peripheral vertigo, especially in BPPV? Why does the BPPV causes vertigo? Owing to the free floating otoconal debris in canalolithiasis or a cupola that has been rendered heavy and gravity sensitive in cupulolithiasis, there is an inappropriate stimulation of canal even after cessation of head motion resulting in a short duration of asymmetry in vestibular efferent input to the CNS that triggers positionally triggered vertigo. So, this is the reason why the vertigo occurs in BPPV, either canalolithiasis or cupulolithiasis. And what do we do during the diagnostic positional test? The patient's head and body are oriented such that there is an ampullofugal or ampullopetal cupular deflection of the inverse semicircular canal that generates the oculomotor patterns pursuant to the Ewald's law that localizes and lateralizes the involved semicircular canal. Julius Ewald, in his experiments in pigeons, framed the laws that bear his name. He cannulated each of the three semicircular canals and applied positive and negative pressures to observe the intensity and direction of the generated nystagmus. Two main outcomes of his experiments are that the generated nystagmus is always directed to the parallel to the plane of the stimulated canal, that is the Ewald's first law. That is what we actually do during the positional test. The generated nystagmus is stronger when the endolymph moves towards the ampulla, that is the ampulopetal cupular deflection in case of horizontal semicircular canals. This is the Ewald's second law. And away from the ampulla, that is ampulofugal cupular deflection in the case of vertical semicircular canals, that is the Ewald's third law. This is what we observe during the post positional test and lateralize and localize the involved canal. So, with that in background, what is done during the BPPV treatment? The non ampullary arm of the semicircular canal has a utricular exit through which the otoconia inappropriately move out of the utricle into the semicircular canal. And this is the point where the non ampullary arms of the posterior and anterior canal they meet to form a cross commune. And it is the non ampullary posterior arm of the horizontal semicircular canal which has the utricular exit. And this is the only way they can be repositioned back because the cupular barrier at the ampullary arm at the ampullary dilatation is impervious to any movement in and out from the utricle. 
So during therapeutic repositioning maneuvers, sequentially orientation of the head and body of the patient is done so that the otoconia are displaced from semicircular canal towards the utricular exit under the influence of gravity. In cupulolithiasis, the inertial forces are generated by head shaking or mastoid exhibition to disengage the otoconia adherent to the cupula or by making use of the gravitational force during the forced prolonged positioning the otoconia are facilitated to drop down from the cupola. With this physiology mentioned, pathophysiology and physiology discussed in previous seven slides, I am coming to some examples. This is a posterior semicircular canal BPPV. This lady had vertigo for around two days. The Dix halpike position test in the right head hanging position elicited an upbeating nystagmus with a torsional component, the upper poles of the eyes are beating towards the patient's right ear, and that is lateralizing the canal to the right side. This is important to know why this oculomotor pattern has generated. The excitatory projections of the right posterior semicircular canal are to the right superior oblique and left inferior rectus. That generates a slow phase because of excitatory impulses in the right posterior ampullary nerve and that leads to primary contraction of the right superior and left inferior oblique and this slow phase VOR is down beating and left torsional. The fast phase VOR which is a refixation second and is clinically appreciable as positional nystagmus is therefore up beating and right torsional as we saw in this case and this is how the Dix halpike position moves the autogonal debris near the ampullary end of the right posterior semicircular canal away from the ampulla that is the ampulloflugal cupular deflection occurs. So what is done to treat such patient? One of the maneuvers is apnea maneuver. The patient is taken to the position where that elicited the nystagmus that is the Dix halpike position maintained in this position for around one minute and after which the head is inclined 90 degrees to the non-involved side. And this position is also maintained for around one minute after which the patient is taken to the non involved lateral recumbent position with the nose pointing downwards. And this position is maintained for another one minute after which the patient is uprighted to the short sitting, completing the one apple maneuver. And this is how the autoconal debris moves from near the ampullary end of the right posterior semicircular canal towards the cross commune into the cross commune and finally into the utricular matrix and thus clearing the canal. Now this debris is no longer available for to cause the asymmetrical stimulation of the membranous plebens when the head moves relative to the gravity. A verifying right supine, a right big sulfide test done in this patient after one hour did not elicit any nystagmus and the patient was free of vertigo as well. This is one of the cases which is the most common garden variety of the uh, most common frequent variant of the BPPV. The second case is a 19 year old male patient who had vertigo for two days. Here the supine roll test elicits a geotropic right sided geotropic nystagmus on right lateral head roll with the quick component beating towards the right ear, the lowermost ear. And it is important to note that the supine roll test has to elicit the nystagmus identical pattern on lateral head roll to the other side. <clears throat> and the lateral head roll to the left elicits a even stronger geotropic nystagmus. And in the geotropic variant of the horizontal canal BPPV, the side that elicits a stronger nystagmus is the involved side. And this was treated as a left long non ampullary arm horizontal semicircular canalolithesis. With the Gufoni manual, from short sitting, the patient was taken to the contralateral, non involved lateral recumbent position, maintained in this position for around one minute. Then the head was inclined downwards, the yaw axis, and this position was maintained for two minutes after which he was uprighted. A verifying supine rule test was done after one hour that did not elicit any nystagmus or lateral head roll to left. or to the right and thus the patient did not have vertigo as well and this testifies the robust response of the positional maneuver that is the therapeutic positional maneuver Gufoni maneuver done to treat this patient. The third patient is this is how the autoconal debris moves from the long posterior arm of the 
left horizontal semicircular canal to near the utricular exit into the utricle and finally clearing the canal. This is a lady 32 year old had vertigo for around seven days positional on either of the lateral recumbent positions. The lateral row had rolled to the right, elicited an apogeotropic nystagmus. This was a quite a long nystagmus of three minutes duration. So I am scrolling it to three minutes. It is still present. And to the lateral head roll to the left, again, it elicited a nystagmus, which was weaker as compared to that elicited on the right side. It was of one minute duration. And so this patient had left sided horizontal semicircular cupulolithiasis. She was treated with head shaking maneuver. With the patient in short sitting, the head was anti flexed around 30 degrees and shaken side to side in 30 degree excursions for 30 seconds. And a verifying supine roll test was done after one hour that did not elicit any nystagmus on lateral head roll to right. You can see absolutely static eyes here as well as to the left. And the patient of free of vertigo. The response, the robust response to the horizontal semicircular <coughs> pupillolithiasis implies that in this patient, the otoconal debris which was adherent to the utricular side of the cupola by the inertial forces generated as a consequence of the head shaking was disengaged and as it directly dispersed into the utricular matrix, it, the patient had a complete relief of vertigo. Reasons for inadequate response in maneuvers are incorrectly chosen maneuver, three eyes, inappropriately executed maneuver, inadequate number of maneuvers, the number of positioning maneuvers is not clearly specified. In one of the papers from the Bhattacharya, Neil Bhattacharya et al. in 2017, a total of five were effective in almost 100% of the patients with posterior canal. A total of two Gofone or Apiani maneuver are effective according to the position paper or the RCT paper from Mandala and Kim in 2012 and 13. Anterior semicircular canal BPPV not clearly specified in most studies. My personal choice is five. So these are the next three slides are the literature I am citing from the giants Michael Stroop and Thomas Brand because of the patho mechanism of BPPV anti-vertiginous substances are not sufficiently effective against symptoms in long term. The only exception is sensitive patients who develop severe nausea after a single maneuver. In this case, diamond hydrogenate 100 milligram half an hour before performing the laboratory maneuver can make the therapy easier. Likewise, according to the Robert Ballo, the drugs like meclizine or promethazine have relatively little use in the management of BPPV because acute attacks are not suppressed by these drugs and PRP are much more effective. These are the clinical practice guidelines of the American Academy of Otolaryngology, Hand, Neck and Surgery published in 2017. Uh, they recommend against routine medications based on observational studies and preponderance of benefits over harm. The exceptions have been noted, severely symptomatic patients is using other form of treatment and patients requiring profile access for CRP. So my final take is repositioning maneuvers and oblique or physical therapy is the only recommended form of treatment in majority of BPPV patients. Identification of semicircular canal that is localization and site localization is pertinent if the diagnosis of BPPV is to be considered. Vestibular suppressants are neither useful nor recommended. The three B recommendations, as I call them from Brand, Balo, and Bhattacharya, singular neurectomy and posterior semicircular canal occlusion may be considered in resistant cases. That is my final take. Thank you. I finish my lecture here. Now I request uh, Dr. T.K. Banerjee, the con speaker, uh, to present this uh, talk. Visible, right? Uh, yes, right. Visible, we can okay. see it. We can see it. Go on. All right. Uh, good morning, friends. Actually, my predecessor has spoken extremely well to present his case, and he has spoken in support of the motion. My task is to speak against the motion. 
So, I mean, um, as he has very well said, the underlying mechanism of PPPV is that there is migration of otoliths from this regional place in the utricle into the semicircular canal or into the cupola. And that um, leads to some kind of abnormal sensory afferents going to the brain and which is manifested clinically as vertigo. So the rationale for treatment in this case is to reposition these uh, otoliths from their migratory um, semicircular canal condition to their original position in the utricle. And my predecessor has very well demonstrated the maneuvers that has been so effective to reposition them and treat this disease. But is that enough? So I have a few points to say that this particular reposition maneuver is not enough. Point number one, you see, um, he has mentioned that in posterior canal BPPV, which is the commonest type of BPPV, uh, and the particular maneuver, which is the way of treating it, the airplay maneuver, is effective in 70 to 85% of cases. In horizontal canal BPPV, the Buffoni maneuver has a response rate of 61%. Barbecue roll has a response rate of 70%. In superior canal BPPV, which is of course extremely rare, again, we go for the Epley maneuver, which has a response rate of 76%. And Yakovino uh, maneuver has a response rate of 79%. So what does it indicate? It indicates that around, at, at the most 80% of the cases, these repositioning maneuver is effective. So there is around 20 to 30 percent of the cases which in case conditions this repositioning maneuver is not effective. So that means that reposition maneuver RPM is not enough. Uh, now the in those cases there are resistant cases uh, um, and in those cases we go for this sophisticated patient positioning system like you use the mechanic, mechanized devices like apnea on mias, rotator, the TRV chairs, and other forms of vestibular rehabilitation therapy to um, uh, get the benefit. Or we can go for posterior semicircular canal occlusion where you plug in into the particular semicircular canal, and thereby collapsing the semicircular canal and eliminating the abnormal sensations that pass out from there and thereby abolishing the BPPV. In extremely refractory cases, we may even resort to surgical intervention like singular neurectomy, which is performed. The benefit of uh, posterior canal, occlusion, posterior semicircular canal occlusion over neurectomy is that it can preserve hearing, but in very resistant cases, we may have to resort to singular neurectomy. Uh, the point number two uh, that I have, uh, RPM is not enough, is that in nearly 5% of the cases, when you do this repositioning maneuver, the otoliths may be displaced from the posterior canal into the horizontal canal. So patients, rather than getting relief from their vertigo, can lead to another positional vertigo by migration of these um, canalids uh, not to this original position in the utricle, but to another semicircular canal. And that has been observed in almost 5% of the cases. So by doing RPM, we are not really giving benefit to the patients. Point number three, why I say that RPM is not enough, is the fact that in um, a substantial number of patients who have undergone RPM, they develop a phenomenon which we call post-RPM disequilibrium syndrome. And what ex exactly happens in that case is that it's characterized by um, this dizziness, the spells of dizziness that occur during change of head movement, during walking, uh, during change of position in bed. And it is not really true vertigo, but a kind of dizziness or unsteadiness that the patient feels. And that happens in around uh, between 30 to 45 percent of the cases. So that is not an uncommon phenomenon that happens. And that lingers on for two to three weeks and even beyond a month. The underlying cause is said to be some kind of sympathetic autonomic dysfunction. But this sort of phenomenon 
is a very real entity and after the repositioning maneuver this sort of symptom happens so rpm has not been enough to really give a full relief of the patient in bppv and um, there are of course the other kinds of options that we have by which you can shorten the duration of post rpm disciplinary syndrome one is this vestibular rehabilitation therapy or we can use beta histidine at the dose of 12 milligram three times a day for four weeks after this rpm has been performed now this is one uh, study which was published in a chinese journal only this year where they recruited 129 cases of bppv patients who developed this post bppv residual dizziness and they were assigned randomly to three groups 43 patients in each arm one group they are the control groups. They did not receive any specific treatment after this procedure or maneuver. But the other two groups, one received rehabilitation, intense rehabilitation training for four weeks. Another uh, group received beta histidine at a dose of 12 milligram of beta histidine three times a day for a period of four weeks. And it has been observed that the median number of days where you do not give any treatment after this, they develop this post BPPV, uh, post RPM disequilibrium syndrome. It lasts for 19 days. But when we assign them to this group of uh, vestibular rehabilitation therapy or to beta histidine, you can shorten the duration to a median of around 14 days. So this type of uh, uh, other options actually shortens the duration of uh, post um, post uh, maneuver disequilibrium syndrome or dizziness. There was another um, study which was published, um, and that was uh, actually published in the American Academy of Otolaryngology. Here, the um, patients received beta histine at a dose of 48 milligram daily for seven days after the EPD maneuver when they developed this disequilibrium syndrome and they found a much better outcome in relieving these patients from this disequilibrium when we applied them um, beta histine 48 milligram per day. Um, now, there are certain cases where this post RPM disequilibrium may persist for a longer period of time, more than one month, and are said to be more prevalent. Those where this maneuver is done when they are above the age of 65 years, when the patient has associated anxiety or depression, when the uh, duration of this BPPV before the maneuver was administered was a much longer duration, and when multiple um, sort of maneuvers were needed in a particular patient. Uh, this was a study which was published in uh, Clinical Neurophysiology 2014. And there, 90 patients with idiopathic BPPV were treated with repositioning maneuver. Of them, 38% reported um, residual uh, disequilibrium on the second day after the successful repositioning maneuver. And the mean duration of this uh, disequilibrium uh, syndrome lasted for between 11.6 plus minus 3.9 days. Now, those cases, um, where the duration of BPPV was for a longer duration with a median duration of 14.1, had a higher chance of developing uh, residual disequilibrium. But those cases where the duration of BPPV before the maneuver was administered was shorter with a median uh, days of 10.9 uh, days, there the disequilibrium, residual disequilibrium was less and there was statistically significant. So there was a correlation demonstrated between the duration of BPPV before the maneuver was administered and the duration of the residual disequilibrium. That study also demonstrated that anxiety plays a role in increasing body sways. Um, now, in this retrospective study in 361 patients with BPPV of, of any semicircular canal, the study showed a disequilibrium in around 30% of patients. Now, no matter where, which canal is involved, uh, which semicircular canal is involved, there was no significant difference between the rate of developing the disequilibrium syndrome. 
Now, those patients who received more than one repository maneuver, now among in this study, 229 patients received one maneuver and 132 patients received two or more maneuvers. And it showed there is a significant higher prevalence of instability or disequilibrium in those who receive two or more maneuvers. So you can see here 17.9% when they had one maneuver and 50%, um, as many as 50%, if two or maneuvers are needed in this patient. So it is statistically highly significant. And 47.2% of patients with anxiety who had an underlying premorbid anxiety they presented with more of this um, post maneuver instability syndrome, the BPPV. And uh, patients who are older than 65 showed also a significantly higher percentage of residual disequilibrium. Uh, now, another point, point number four, why I say that this uh, repositioning maneuver is not enough, is that 12% of all BPPV are actually multi-canal BPPV. And there are two types of multi-canal BPPV. In the first category, there is unilateral involvement of posterior and horizontal canal on one side. And the other type of BPPV where on both sides, both posterior semicircular canals are involved in, um, in this BPPV. And this multi-canal BPPV are often, quite often resistant to single uh, repositioning maneuver. They may require multiple sittings. Sometimes they say the one which is more affected, you do the uh, maneuver there first and then go to the other semicircular canal, which is less affected. And this post BPPV disequilibrium syndrome is more common in multi canal BPPV. So many of these patients do need there, this maneuver is not enough really. And they know this sophisticated vestibular rehabilitation therapy. You need those mechanized devices like Epley Omniax rotator, TRV mechanical chair. So in many of the cases, these things are needed. So actually, I rest my case here saying that RPM reposition maneuver in BPPV is not enough. There are other options you have to resort to in really giving benefit to these patients. Thank you very much. Now I would request Dr. Uh, Ramatarak Nath to present his views as the moderator. We congratulate both the speakers, both the pro and the con speakers for their excellent talks. And I agree with Dr. Watts uh, in the sense that patients who persist to have complaints, you should always look for inappropriate in, 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 in repositioning inadequately done. So the thing that you should ask in the history is if the patient asks the patient if he continues to be symptomatic, whether it is that original rotatory vertigo or the disequilibrium syndrome explained by Dr. Banerjee. Because many patients, if you ask, as long as the particles are still in the canal, they still persist to have the rotatory vertigo. But once they have been repositioned, where are they going? They are going into the utricle. So in the utricle, utricle matrix, something fresh has been added now. So what happens is they continue to have the disequilibrium. Mind you, it is not that rotatory vertigo. So for the disequilibrium, which Dr. Benerjee has mentioned, this is probably one assumption that I think, because if you always go back into the history, if the patient is inadequately, patient continues to complain of that vertigo after repositioning, ask him, what is the kind of dizziness that you have? Is it the original rotatory vertigo that you have, or is it the disequilibrium? If it is the disequilibrium, probably the all the particles have freshly been added into the utricle of the um, uh, utricle. So therefore, they continue to be unsteady and therefore there is a case for giving anti vertiginous drugs. So most important thing is if the patient complains of vertigo, you need to go back and ask in the history and see whether it has been an inadequately done procedure or because many times if you, if you do immediately even see why what is the definition of vertigo benign paroxysmal positional vertigo it fatigues it disappears there is no point in saying you have done it again and it has not come so it is cured because it is known the particles will disperse so therefore you may not get it if you do it immediately 
Again, you do it after an overnight's rest, you may still get it. That indicates that the particles are still there free floating. The only thing they are dispersed. Now, in the, after the overnight sleep, if you do it, you will find that there is still some particles left, then you will get the rotatory vertigo. But after that, if they continue to complain of disequilibrium, mind you, they will feel just unsteady being pushed to one side. And those patients are the ones which have post disequilibrium, post repositioning disequilibrium syndrome, where you need to give uh, the antivertiginous drugs. That's my take on this. I hope it's clear. So, uh, Dr. Tharaknath, uh, there are no further questions from the audience. Uh, so, you can go ahead and uh, invite the speakers for their own rebuttal points to support their stand. Sure. What do you think, Dr. Watts? Uh, sir, I do agree with the differences you made. I would add just one thing. If the patient continues to have vertigo, residual vertigo, the, the thing is that where when should you do the verifying positional tests? After one hour, 24 hours. I think both at one hour and 24 hours are important because we need to know whether the there is elimination of the positional nystagmus which we initially saw and plus if any possibility of canal switch which uh, Dr. Banerjee mentioned and if the canal switch has occurred which is very common especially from posterior to the horizontal semicircular canal you need to give a different maneuver at that time and then again do a verifying positional test. Yeah, we will, we'll, which is done. But what I'm trying to say is, uh, once the particles are dispersed, you may not get that same intensity or nystagmus yes. if you do it immediately. So therefore, you should not assume, okay, this patient has been cured. Still, yeah, they that, continue to complain, it is dispersed. Yeah, yeah. In majority of the, the papers where they have done a randomized trials, they do the verifying uh, the positional test after one hour as well as after 24 hours. Secondly, adding to that post BPVV syndromes as the particles are repositioned into the utricle, uh, it's very common for those who have been involved personally in that as the patient is taken up right from the airplay position, sometimes you see that there is severe disequilibrium. The patient tends to fall either forward or backward. It is something like uh, the uh, Tomarkin syndrome, which occurs in veneers. And that is because of the reposition. There is sudden utricular excitation at that moment. So the thing is that as they are repositioned back into the utricle, these it adds a mass to the utricular matrix, and that is the reason for the 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 disequilibrium. And that is a different entity. I do agree with the, that. I never said that uh, the only manoeuvres are effective, but I included that in majority of the cases. My the rebuttal about this for a few weeks. That's yeah. why you need to continue the drugs in those patients where the disequilibrium continues even after the repositioning. Yeah. Because the particles, if once they are not in the canal, that rotatory element is gone. They just have the disequilibrium. Uh, secondly, the multiple ca multiple canal BPP will have uh, the uh, will require more than one manoeuvre because the the. Uh, uh, we need to reposition the uh, autoconal debris from two different canals whose yeah. orientation in the space is different. So we need to do it in several settings because sometimes if the horizontal canal BPPV is involved, that is very common with the unilateral posterior and horizontal semicircular canal BPPV. Uh, it will have severe symptoms of nausea, vomiting and perspiration because we know that horizontal canal BPPV has a severe vegetative symptoms. So I think that has to be done because of the inherent nature of the, the disease, the multiple maneuvers are required. And that is why the post BPPV syndrome uh, is more common in that patient. That is my rebuttal and my take. I'm sure everyone must have experienced that patients have typical history of BPPV when they lie down, they get it. But they would see some doctor or go over the counter drug, take a stomatal and come. When you they come to the clinic, when you do, you know, you'll not get it. You will not get the positional test positive. So that means it is when the vestibular suppressants, they are going to help in what I go, at least to a certain extent in these patients. Yeah. I'm sure you would have had the same experience. Dr. Tharakna, if you could request uh, Dr. Banerjee to give his yeah. Uh, yeah. rebuttals, Banerjee, and then yes. uh, we move on to the polling and uh, the final words from Dr. Rajiv Go ahead, Dr. Banerjee. Right. I, th I think, um, the, I mean, uh, my uh, colleague has given a wonderful uh, sort of message that this is a procedure which has to be done. One has to identify what is BPPV, 
And um, the message should go across to the doctors that just giving vestibular sedative is really counterproductive. It should not be done. Identify these sort of patients and they should go for this repositioning maneuver. That is true. We should not give them those diamine hydrinate or other vestibular sedative that will prolong, that might have a symptomatic relief, but will prolong the problem. So the treatment is simple, you go for the maneuvers. But then again, one um, uh, thing that I have that what is said that to do a Dix Hallback maneuver one hour after doing a successful repositioning, uh, sometimes carries a small risk of again displacing the otolids from the utricle right into the semicircular canal. I mean, that has been demonstrated in a few cases that leads to again this, uh, you know, displacement of the otolids, the semicircular canal. Uh, I would like to have the opinion of my colleagues about it. You are right, sir, because uh, there are studies, if it is done earlier than uh, whatever, if you are doing multiple maneuvers in any session of treatment, if you have done one maneuver, wait for at least 15 minutes to do, to repeat the maneuver or to do a verifying positional test. Because the openings of the common crust and that of the non uticular exit of the horizontal semicircular canal are very near to near. So there is a chance that if you do a positional test again, or you do a apply maneuver or any other maneuver again, the otoconal debris which has been repositioned back into the utricle may go into the horizontal semicircular canal. So that is the reason for the canal switch. And if the patient remains upright during that time, say for example, 15 to 20 minutes after doing the maneuver, the otoconal debris, which has been repositioned back into the utricle, is theoretically expected to disperse into the utri gelatinous utricular matrix. And so it will no longer be available near the openings of the common crust and the non uticular, uh, uh, non ampullary exit of the horizontal semicircular canal to cause a canal switch. That is my take. So, uh, Dr. Tharakna, uh, if I would request you to please now hand it over to Dr. Rajiv Anand for his final concluding remarks and the post uh, debate polling also. Over to Rajiv. Yeah, so a lot of uh, knowledge has been added to by two eminent debaters. In fact, they agreed on most of the point with each other also. So, probably the debate is was a source of knowledge that which are the cases which are going to respond to repositioning maneuver and what are the problem and repositioning maneuver do not work so can we have the poll first post uh, debate poll is it available yeah sure dr rajiv uh, i think you can see it on your screen now yeah we'll allow them 30 seconds to answer the question and then you can give your concluding remarks Yeah, Dr. Rajiv, okay. I think the results are out, yeah. Okay. So there has been actually uh, the debate, uh, according to the audience, goes in favor of Dr. Banerjee, who has won by, and in fact, the poll has also swung in his favor, that put repositioning maneuvers are not the only actually it is the uh, nomenclature of the debate is difficult to defend even dr Wirtz is not saying that uh, repositioning maneuvers are not the only treatment and both of them agree on repositioning maneuver as being essential so 
what we know about BPVV is what we have learned from two speakers who have spoken so eloquently that it is a entity which needs to be correctly identified in terms of which canal is in, uh, involved. Also, you have to institute the correct maneuver so that to have a majority of the patient responding to the treatment. That's the mainstay of treatment in this. But it has also been stressed that almost around 30% of the patient will continue to have some symptoms post repositioning maneuver, which as Dr. Tarak said, you ask the history again, whether patient has persistent vertigo or patient has persistent dizziness. And I also add that in one of the slide, uh, Dr. Banerjee added that anxiety is a prevalent symptom. So we must address two post repositioning maneuver symptoms by accurate diagnosis and the drugs which help the patient better. So this is what we have learned from both these speakers. Both these speakers have concluded, and I add to that, that we must address to accurate diagnosis, accurate repositioning maneuver, and addressing post repositioning symptoms also. Thank you.